Good afternoon and welcome to the Serica Energy PLC Investor Presentation. Throughout this recorded presentation, investors will be in listen-only mode. Questions are encouraged. Can be submitted at any time via the Q&A tab situated in the right-hand corner of your screen. Just click Q&A, scroll to the bottom, type your question and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question received during the meeting itself. However, the company review all questions submitted today and publish responses where it's appropriate to do so. Before we begin, I'd like to submit the following poll. I'd now like to hand you over to Mitch Flegg, CEO. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Thanks. Uh, and thanks, everyone, for uh, for joining us this afternoon. Um, this is uh, the same presentation that um, that we made to um, to the analysts uh, immediately following our results, which went out uh, on Thursday last week. Um, we had a lot of feedback from uh, from shareholders that um, um, that they would like to know exactly what we say to the analysts. And, uh, and we're, we're only too pleased to uh, to be able to deliver this. Um, and give you this presentation. It's it's a fairly long presentation, um, so I will try and go through it relatively quickly. Um, it's on our website, it's on this site here, so you can go through the detail uh, at, at your own leisure. I, I think what I would like to do though, is to get through it quickly so that we can leave adequate time for the, the Q&A session, which I think is is probably the most, uh, most important part of this. Um, and we've got a number of questions that have been sent in in advance, um, and uh, we'll address those and uh, and hopefully you'll you'll uh, you'll add some more questions as we as we go along um for those of the you those of you that aren't familiar with the company serica is a, uh, a uk focused exploration and production company um we're now one of the leading mid-tier independent oil and gas producers um and we're responsible for delivering over five percent of the uk's gas production um which right now uh you know is a vital contribution to to the country's security of supply and you know we've all seen from the the terrible events in uh in in, in ukraine just recently and the knock-on effect of that how important it is that that we have that uh, that security of supply um our, our assets are all based in the central and northern north sea um we have a cluster of assets around the bruce field um and um, uh, we have uh, Bruce Keith and Rumfields up there. And then in the Central North Sea, we have Columbus and Erskine. And we will talk a little bit more about those um, um, a little later. Uh, we've got a team of uh, 170 staff. Um, and you know what we're about is really using technology and our experience to reduce the costs, to reduce the emissions, and therefore maximize the life of the assets that we have. So our producing assets, Bruce, Keith, Rum, Erskine in particular, are all relatively late life. They're midlife to late life assets. Um, and, and, and our game is to try and improve those assets to extend the life uh, and, and to, to get more value out of those assets. These are, uh, are generally fields that have been in production for at least 20 years. Um, they were generally um, discovered and developed by, by majors, um, you know, companies like B, BP, Total, um, were, were involved in uh, in these assets, um, but they've got to a stage in their life where it's inappropriate probably for uh, a major to be running these assets, uh, and it's more appropriate for a nimble, dynamic company like Serica um, to extract that, uh, that, that remaining value. These are our results for, for, for 2021. So I'll take a, a couple of minutes just to talk about some of the numbers. Um, we, uh, we delivered uh, very, very strong profits um, at, at almost le every level. So at a gross level, at a cash flow level, um, uh, at a, at a pre-tax or post-tax level. Um, and um, we, we'll touch on the numbers a little bit later. Um, what we're particularly proud of is that um, at the same time as we managed to realize those profits, we've actually not significantly dented our, our reserves, uh, the, the, the oil and gas that we have below ground. We have an independent uh, assessment made every year of, uh, of our remaining reserves. And last year, that actually increased from 61 million to 62 million barrels of oil equivalent. Um, I use that phrase a lot, barrels of oil equivalent. Most of our production is actually gas. Um, but uh, people find it difficult to uh, to comprehend gas volumes when we talk in billions of cubic feet. Um, so we convert everything to, um, uh, to, to to barrels of oil equivalent. So so yeah, we we we've maintained our reserves um, whilst uh, creating significant um, um, profits from from what we produced in the last year. Um, how have we done that? 
Um, well, we've done it by investing in our assets. And, 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 you know, again, this is our strategy. We're continually investing time and money in our assets. Um, last year, there were two big projects. This year, we've got two more big projects, and I'll come on to them in a bit more detail. Um, but we had what we call the R3 project, which was rejuvenating an old well on the run platform, and Columbus, which was a, which was a new development. We invested in both of those. It's an investment that goes back several years, um, but it, it, it actually paid off very, very nicely for us because we brought those fields into, or those wells, into production in the second half of last year which really benefited from the uh, very high uh, gas prices that we were seeing um, and still still are seeing um, uh, that really started from the midpoint in next year. Uh, and the, all those things together have enabled us to announce uh, an increased dividend. Our dividend uh, in the previous year was three and a half pence. We increased our dividends to nine pence per share, um, or that will be recommended to, um, to shareholders at the AGM in, in June this year. Our production, importantly, is over 85% gas. Um, this has been increased somewhat in the last year because the two new projects, R3 and Columbus, were both predominantly gas. Um, and, and really, being a gas producer right now is, uh, is more important than ever. Um, the new British energy security strategy um, actually recognises this, uh, this importance. Um, but it's not just a question for us of producing more and more gas. It's a question of trying to produce more gas and reduce our carbon footprint at the same time because the gas that is produced in the UK generally has a lower carbon footprint than for example imported LNG which um, the process of, uh, of, trans of, of, of liquefying, transporting and degasifying um, LNG is far more carbon intensive so not only are we producing the gas that is needed uh, domestically um, but we're producing it with, with, with fewer carbon emissions. And our gas um, uh, is produced and goes straight into the national grid. Um, uh, a proportion of that goes directly um, to um, domestic users um, for, for, you know, to go directly into cookers or for, for heating. Um, and a proportion goes into electricity manufacture, which again ends up with domestic uh, users through the, uh, the, um, um, uh, through, through the electricity network. Um, the industry is a, a huge employer. Um, we create, not, not Serica, but as an industry, uh, we support something like 200,000 jobs in the UK, um, which is uh, obviously to everyone's benefit. I talked a little bit about um, our, um, our strategy, um, uh, and the strategy is to, um, to, to add value to our assets through uh, the implementation of technology and, and continued uh, investment. Um, we're able to do this because we have a very strong balance sheet. We have cash on the balance sheet. We have no debt, which is really, I think, quite unusual amongst uh, amongst our peers. Uh, and we have limited decommissioning liability. So we have limited, you know, stored costs, if you like, to decommission the uh, the platforms that we that we use. And that's due really to the kind of innovative nature of the deals that we've done. When we bought these assets, we've tended to to leave the decommissioning liabilities with the people that we bought them from. So we've always had this investment strategy and we've managed to execute this, this investment strategy year on year, despite commodity prices. So it's quite easy for me to sit here now with, with gas prices uh, around wherever they are today, you know, towards 200 pence a therm. It's quite easy to talk about investing in, in this scenario. But it's only two years ago that we were seeing gas prices that were sub eight pence a therm. Um, and uh, at that stage, we were still confident enough in, in our ability and confident enough in the future of the industry that we were still making um, investment commitments and investing even in those, uh, those pretty, pretty dark times when, when gas prices were very low. Um, in, in, in 2021, we spent something like 52 million pounds um, on capital expenditure, and that will be increased this year. So we would expect it to be closer to 60 million this year. So we're continuing to invest in our assets. Last year, as I say, we had the RUM R3 well, uh, which is now online, and Columbus, which is now online. Um, in this year, 2022, we have an exploration well, and I'll come back and talk about that a little bit more, um, which is quite an exciting uh, step out for us. Uh, and we also have an intervention campaign when we're going to go back to a number of wells on our Bruce Keith and RUM fields um, and try and improve 
uh, improve those wells to add production and hopefully to add reserves to, uh, to to the portfolio. So, and then we have in 2023 and 2024, um, you know, further uh, investment campaigns coming along because we're, we're not, you know, we're, we're in no way at the end of this strategy. We still see that we can continue to add value to uh, to, to the portfolio. So some numbers. Um, and, and I think, you know, we're just concentrating here on the last four years in each of these. And you can see uh, how, how lumpy this this industry can, uh, can sometimes be. Um, 2019, um, uh, our revenue was uh, was around 250 million pounds. Um, so it's our total sales revenue for the gas and oil that we produce. Um, it halved the following year. Um, so in 2020, it was down to 126 million pounds. This year, it was over half a billion. Uh, and it, it shows that we need to have strategies that can cope with these peaks and troughs uh, of, of activity. Um, the peaks and troughs are even more pronounced when you when you look at that in in terms of a gross profit or a profit before taxation um, level. We do see uh, you know a strong correlation between revenue and, uh, and and profits. As I've said through all of that, we managed to keep our reserves um, relatively un, uh, unscathed, and I will come back to that. But what we have managed to do is to grow our cash balance. So our cash. Uh, plus plus cash equivalents and hedging advances have grown um, such that at the end of last year, they were in excess of uh, 200 million pounds, uh, which gives us the ability to to recommend the increased dividend. So talking about cash, um, the the plot here shows the the, the cash build um, that we've had over the uh, over the last few years. Um, and as you can see, I, I've, I've used the phrase already uh, or used the, the, the term lumpy already. It's not a straight line. Um, you know, nothing uh, in this industry ever is a straight line. And this does reflect the um, uh, the impact of commodity prices uh, year on year. But we are seeing generally that uh, that strong increase and the increase in the first five months of this year. Uh, has been even stronger. So as at 20th of April, which was last Wednesday, the day before we ha uh, we issued these results, um, the combined cash and cash deposits um, and hedging advances had risen to over 360 million pounds. So um, a strong cash build uh, from the uh, from the portfolio. We do have a hedging policy. We have always had hedges in place um, to protect ourselves from the downside. Uh, and that's one of the reasons we were able to, um, to continue investing during the, the difficult times in 2020. Um, we do not, however, uh, attempt to hedge to, to, to lock in the upside. Um, we believe that um, our investors uh, are in a, in a better position to do that than, than, than we are. So we have very, very modest levels of hedging. Um, something like 20% of our production is hedged at very modest prices to give us that protection should there be a, a price crash. We've added no new hedges since the middle of last year. I think July last year was the last time we put hedges in place. And part of that is, is, is really that we now have more cash on deposit. Um, and so we are better equipped to, to withstand any um, uh, any downside um, shocks on oil and gas prices, um, so we have less less requirement for that uh, for that hedging. So modest hedging to give us downside protection. It's worth looking, I think, at the um, uh, at the commodity prices over the last couple of years. I, I'm trying to show gas prices and oil prices on here. So gas prices are the the grey uh, bars, um, which we're more interested in because 85% of our production is gas. Uh, the orange is the uh, is, is the oil price. And we can see that we've seen um, more highs and lows in gas. So gas, as I said, was 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 down in the kind of eight pence per therm. Um, where are we almost exactly two years ago? Um, we saw a, you know, a modest increase through the start of last year. And, and to put this in perspective, the long term Average gas prices have probably been between 30 and 50 pence per therm. Um, and so at the start of last year, at the start of 21, we saw a return to those long term averages. But it was only really in the second half of last year we saw um, the, the, this sudden ramp up to unprecedented highs uh, for, for of, of gas prices. Um, we've also seen oil prices recovering, but it's gas in particular that has this, you know, relatively short term. We're still only probably six months into into this um, unprecedented spike. Um, 
this this plot probably doesn't show the whole story. This is the average price for the month, and we've seen greater volatility um, within the month, within the day. You know, we've we've seen huge swings on on very short periods of time. So it's a far um, more comfortable position for us as a gas producer now uh, than it than it was uh, only two years ago. Um, and all of this, as I said, um, means that we are in a position to propose a dividend of nine pence per share uh, for, for, for this year. So a little bit about the assets and a little bit about the company now. Um, we, as I, as I think I mentioned, we, we have an independent assessment made on an annual basis of, of our reserves. So how much oil and gas do we have remaining in the ground? Um, and, and we assess that on the 1st of January every year, or we have an independent company do that. Um, and I've just showed the last two years here. So in each of the last two years, um, we've produced a certain amount of oil and gas. So we produced over 15 million barrels of oil equivalent in the last two years. Uh, and in each of those two years, we've had um, um, a revision in the reserves that we have um, because of the work we've done to extend the life of our assets, because of the technical um, uh, improvements we've made to the fields that we have. We've managed to ink well, and because of R3, the, 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 the well that we, we brought back into production, uh, we've managed to increase reserves um, at a faster rate than than we were producing the reserves last year. So last year, we produced 7.3 million barrels, but we revised upwards by 8.5 million barrels. Now, I think it's a pretty neat trick. I mean, I think to, to be able to, um, to, to produce that much oil, to sell it, to make that considerable level of profit, but to still have the same amount or more oil left, or oil and gas left um, at, at the end of the year is, uh, is it's, it's what we're about. And to me, that is a, uh, a demonstration that our strategy is working, that we can take these assets, we can add value to the assets and extract more value from those assets and extend the life um, uh, 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 of, of our portfolio. So um, I think that's that's a, it's a technical slide, um, but it demonstrates, I think, very well um, um, what, what our strategy is, is all about. As I said, we want to do all of this whilst uh, improving our environmental footprint. This presentation isn't really about ESG. Um, we have um, um, a, a, an annual ESG report, which will be issued within the next couple of weeks. Um, and at that stage, we'll probably be talking far more about what we're doing um, on, on the ESG front, on the environmental front. But we're very proud that we managed to, at the same time as, as, as creating profits, we're reducing our, our, our footprint. So we've reduced our flaring volumes by 53% in two years. And we reduced them by 30% the year before that. So, you know, we're making big strides to, to, to cut out flaring, which is one of the biggest sources of CO2 emissions. We've cut our overall CO2 emissions significantly. And, and it doesn't just stop there. We're also looking at waste to landfill. We, I'm trying to get this down to zero. We didn't quite make it. But to get waste to landfill down by 88% in two years is, uh, is significant. Um, and, and we have to do that. To be a responsible operator these days, uh, we have to be able to, to, to achieve those things. Um, we, I know um, a, a lot of people here are interested in, in production levels. Um, uh, this shows our production through last year. So um, at the first half of last year, we were averaging, I think it was around 18, 19,000 uh, BOE per day. Uh, there was a planned shutdown during the summer uh, when our offtake pipeline is shut down. So we took the opportunity to uh, to do some some maintenance on our own equipment, um, and then you can see I think the the rapid increase in the in the second half of the year um, when we got up to an average for the year of I think twenty two thousand two hundred BOE per day, but in the second half of the year we're averaging I think twenty five. Uh, towards the end of the year we were up towards the thirty thousand barrels of oil equivalent per day. Um, this year has started generally quite strong, although we did have a well-publicized rum shutdown in uh, in March, um, which which meant that, that 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 month was slightly below where we would have liked to be, but um, but generally good strong production um, uh, thus far this year. I think importantly, um, it, we, this year also marks the fact that the the deal under which we bought the Bruce Keith and Rum assets uh, has come to an end. Um, it was a really innovative deal. Um, 
that enable us to um, effectively we bought the assets on on HP. I, I like to think of it. We um, um, we shared the the cash flow from those assets with the companies that sold them to us for the first four years. Um, so the companies that sold them to us were BP, Total, BHP, and a, and a smaller company called Marabeni. Um, and, and we shared those. Uh, the, we shared the cash flow such that in the first year we were only keeping forty percent of the cash flow. Second year we kept fifty percent. Um, in the last two years we've been keeping sixty percent. But now from the first of January this year. Um, we keep 100%. And, and obviously, that's happened uh, again at a very fortunate time for us uh, because it, 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 it corresponds to the, uh, to the very high um, uh, production levels and the very high uh, commodity prices that we're seeing. So, this really is a step change for us now. In 2022, we're seeing 100% of, uh, uh, of the cash flow from these assets. I'm not going to dwell too much on the next couple of slides because I think these are these are history and they've been flagged pretty well. I talked about the RUM R3 well. Um, this was a it was a really complex engineering project and it was a big project. It was an 80 million pound project, uh, 80 million pound investment for us and our partners um, to, um, to 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 re to, to intervene on a well that had been drilled um, 15, 16 years ago, but the previous operator had, had had problems with it and had never managed to get it into production. So we went back into that well, removed some equipment, put some new completion equipment in there, got it back onto production um, in, in, in August. And you can see the impact in terms of, uh, of our net production uh, in the at the end of last year compared to the start of last year. So that well has added something like 6,000 BOE per day net to Serica. Um, there's some numbers in there that kind of put all this into perspective. Um, you know, it was it was an 84 million pound project, um, but the the value in December of, of the gas that was being produced out of that well was in excess of a million pounds a day. So you can see that that project uh, has the ability to pay back uh, uh, very, very quickly. Um, the other project uh, that we did last year was the Columbus well. Um, we, Columbus was a field that was was discovered by Serica some years ago. It took a long time to get it to market, um, but we eventually uh, drilled the development well uh, last year um, and got first production in November. Um, it's another gas, well, it's a gas condensate field, but 80% of the production is, is gas. Um, another fairly expensive project for us and our partners. We have a 50% interest for us and our partners. It was like a 76 million pound uh, project. Um, and that well came on uh, and produced very well um, in, in November and December. It's been a little bit disappointing in the first few months of this year. There have been some topsides problems. So this field goes back through uh, through someone else's platform and someone else's processing equipment. Uh, it goes back through the Shearwater platform. And Shearwater has had some downtime so far this year. Um, and so production hasn't been a strong um uh, as we would have liked. Um, I think the reservoir de deliverability is not as good as we might have expected. Um, but generally, again, bringing that well on at a time of high commodity prices at relatively high high uh, rates has been uh, has been very valuable to us. Uh, and again, you can see from the numbers here, that the payback on that project is uh, is is relatively short. We're not finished there. Um, we're going to continue investing. So we've got two big projects this year. We've got this light well intervention campaign. Um, so we're going to go back to um, uh, up to five um, wells on BKR. Uh, these are subsea wells that no one has been into for the last, I don't know, probably 12 years or so. Um, and we're going to go and do some some late life maintenance on these on these wells. Um, uh, some of it will just be clean up uh, and, and access to the reservoir. We'll, we'll do some production logging surveys. We will re-perforate um, some of the old zones. Um, and we will add additional perforations um, and water shutoffs in, in some of those wells. So that will be happening this summer. Um, and we are targeting uh, not just an uplift in production, but some new reserves from that, uh, up to um, 4 million BOE, uh, potentially, of, of, of gas reserves uh, from that. And then the big project this year is the North Egg Exploration Well. So, you know, we're not an out-and-out -out wildcat exploration company. We don't drill a lot of exploration wells. 
we're probably never going to be in the situ situation where we go out wildcatting, drilling in the middle of nowhere um, to, to, to try and find uh, new resources. But we do believe in, in what we call infrastructure led exploration. So exploration prospects that are close to our existing infrastructure, um, we think can be potentially very, very, very valuable to us, uh, not just because of the reserves that we might find, but also because of uh, the fact if we can bring these reserves back through our existing platforms, we enhance and extend the life of those platforms. We bring down our unit costs so we will have benefits on the other fields of ours that use those same platforms. So we're going to draw the North Egg Exploration Prospect this year. It's exploration, so um, there's no guarantee of success. Um, but we believe the, the, the P50 or the mid-case um, reserves are around 60 million BOE. Um, as I said, the current reserves of the company are 62 million BOE. So, you know, this is this will be not far. It has the capacity to be not far short of, of doubling the, the company's reserves. It's similar and very, very close to our existing rum field. So we understand the geology. We understand the, how, how this was sourced. Um, we've got good quality 3D seismic over it. So and we can see that the geophysical um, attributes are, are similar. Um, so we think it, it is as de-risked as it can be. Um, and, and so the next thing now is to drill it. Um, we've contracted the, the rig, the, uh, the Paul B. Lloyd Jr. Uh, and we expect to spud in July. Um, if it's successful, as I say, we would expect to, to be able to tie it back to our nearby Bruce facilities, um, which will be therefore a relatively quick job to tie it back and relatively inexpensive if, if anything in this industry can ever be uh, inexpensive. Uh, and incidentally, if uh, if that comes in, there's another prospect uh, imaginatively called South Egg, um, which um, is relatively close, which would be uh, a very good candidate for drilling if, if North Egg works. So it's an exciting prospect um, to be drilled uh, this summer. Um, I, I talked. I talked a little bit about Columbus, and I've talked a little bit about the fact that we had a a, a rum um, uh, delay or deferral during the first um, half, quarter of this year. Uh, as a result of that, we've uh, we've revisited revisited our production guidance for this year, and I expect our production to fall within the twenty six to thirty thousand boe per day range uh, for for, for two thousand and twenty two. Um, so um, strong production um, continuing and hopefully continuing into the into the following year. I talked up until now. So what's that? 25 slides. Um, and, and that's all been about one plank of our strategy. You know, um, it's about getting more value and, uh, and, and extracting value and extending the life of the of the portfolio of the assets that, that we have. There is, however, a completely separate strength plank of the strategy. Um, and that is around growing the portfolio through mergers and acquisition. Um, and we spend a huge amount of time um, looking for opportunities to, to grow the portfolio. Um, we're looking primarily still in, in the UK. We believe that we have the skills and the team and the relationships with the regulator, with the supply chain, uh, with, with everyone involved. Um, we think that, um, that, that the UK is, is still the right place for us. But we need to find things where we think we can add volume. We're not just going out there to, to buy assets for the hell of it. Um, and it, 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 is, it is complex. And, and commodity price volatility has added to that complexity. But we still see a number of opportunities to, to grow that portfolio. Um, and we're still very, very committed to, to, to the whole M&A um, um, process. So that kind of brings me to the end. I think I've almost got to the, uh, the, the half hour mark. Um, just as a reminder, where are we? Well, we're, we're a producing company producing a significant amount of, of oil, but predominantly gas. Um, we're investing a lot to, um, to, to add low carbon energy to, to help the UK's energy security. We are benefiting from, from high, high gas prices at the moment. There's, there's no denying that. Um, we believe we're doing our bit to um, reduce the country's reliance on, uh, on, on imports. Um, and we think we've got a fantastic operating capability. So we're, we're very well positioned. We've got no borrowings. We've got no decommissioning or very little decommissioning liability. We've got considerable cash. And now we are in a position where we get 100% of the cash flow 
uh, from um, uh, from um, the uh, from the BKR assets. So we're very very well positioned, in a very strong position to 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 go into the M and A market. We're still not finished with the strategy of adding value to our assets. We've done our three. We've done Columbus. But going forward, we have the North Egg Exploration Well and the Light Well Intervention Campaign. So, so that's the summary. Uh, that that um, necessarily has had to be a little bit uh, of, of a whistle stop tour. Um, uh, I think you know we're always willing to to talk to shareholders, and I like talking to shareholders. Um, you can always contact us at any time um, through our website or through info at sericaenergy.com. Uh, I think anyone who ever has contacted us there will 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 um, will tell you that they've got a response back. Um, we won't duck any questions. Um, so, you know, we're, we've got a half an hour left here. I hope I can get through as many of your questions as possible, but I see there's a, a huge number have come through and I've not been able to read all of them as we're speaking. Um, we've, got some, we've got some questions. Well, I'll hand you back anyway. I was going to say, Mitch, just to give you a little moment just to read some of those questions and, and thank you very much for the presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, do please continue to submit your questions and, and thank you for submitting those uh, you have done so far. But on Mitch, it's just a few moments to have a review of those already submitted. I'd like to remind you the recording of the presentation, along with a copy of the slides and the published Q&A, can be accessed via your investor dashboard. As Mitch said, we did receive a number of pre-submitted questions, as well as those submitted today, uh, and to thank you to everyone who submitted them. Mitch, perhaps if I can, I know I haven't given you a huge amount of time, and that those questions are probably growing. If I could hand back to you just to turn through some of the pre-submitted and the, the live questions, that'd be fantastic. Thank you indeed. Yeah, I mean, I, I just, just reading through the live questions, I, I, I will start off with some of the pre submitted ones because um there's a lot of overlap between what what's been submitted and 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 what's what's coming in as we still coming in as we speak um you know i'll start off with the, the big one that the question that's been asked most um is is probably summarized by by one of the one of the questions that um that, that came in uh in, in advance uh, and it was as follows um what was the logic behind the dividend announcement Many people were underwhelmed by a 9p dividend. It would be nice to know how the board came to this decision. Um, and as, as I say, this is the most common um, uh, question that, that we've received and, and I've received from outside of this process as well. Um, I, I, I think we need to, um, uh, or I probably need to, to remind everybody that we do not consider ourselves to be an income stock. We consider ourselves to be a growth stock. Um, it's always been our intention uh, and our um, and we work towards rewarding shareholders through share price growth um, rather than through dividends. Um, you know, this time last year, our share price was around, I think, about about 120 pence. Um, the last time I looked today, it was around 390 pence. Um, five years ago, it was 26 pence. Um, so I, I think our, our focus and the focus of everyone in the company um, is, to, um, is to reward shareholders through growth. However, we know, and it's that word again, growth is lumpy. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't come in a straight line. Um, and so we some time ago launched a dividend policy um, to, that is aimed at rewarding shareholders um, in the times when the lumpy growth isn't as fast as it as, as it is at the moment. Um, and so the, the nine pence dividend is a, um, a continuation of that existing policy. It is not our primary aim to reward shareholders through the dividend policy, um, but it is a method of rewarding um, shareholders in periods that the growth isn't as high as it has been just now so that was the that was the board logic um and um yeah there's 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 there's, there's not there's not much that i can i can add to that um this of course all is subject to uh, shareholder approval at the at the agm the next question which is kind of related um uh, and and comes up a number of times um and i'll take from the, uh, the, the pre-submitted questions is, um, what is the future strategy? For five years, management have hinted at acquisitions, but not willing to overpay. A number of deals have been done in the sector during that time. It is the market that determines the price. If the company does not want to acquire due to high prices, then they should look to sell the company to give shareholders value. So I think that's, a, that's an interesting point and quite a strong point. Um, so first of all, it starts with what is the future strategy? Well, I, I think I've I think I've explained the strategy, but I'll, I'll reiterate: the strategy is to 
add value and extend the life of our existing assets. Um, and the second part of it is to grow the portfolio through, through M&A. Um, the second part of the question uh, suggests that we should sell the company to give shareholders value. And I'm, I'm afraid I, I just don't agree with that. Um, and, you know, I believe that we've got the skills and the team uh, and the knowledge and, uh, and, and the ability to create further shareholder value. I think we can demonstrate that we have been creating shareholder value for the last five years. Um, we've grown the company. We've generated significant cash reserves. Um, so we're in a, in a very good position to take it forward whilst, whilst maintaining our, our oil and gas reserves. So I think we have created shareholder value. I think we can show that we've created that you know, in, in abundance in the last year. Uh, and so I, I don't, I'm afraid, agree with the, uh, the, the view that we should sell the company um, to, 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 to give shareholders value. Um, the next one uh, really comes um, back where it, it has a couple of questions in it, um, but it, it um, I'll read it out, it says, given that there are no taxes on dividend payments, why not pay an extra special dividend instead of a buyback program? Uh, it goes on then to talk about a few other things, but um, I'll answer those. I mean, first part is I'm, I'm not a tax expert and I'm not here to give tax advice, but I don't think it's true to say that there are no taxes on dividend payments. Um, I, you know, I'd advise people to take their, their own advice on that. But secondly, uh, I, I'd like to, to make it clear that, that we haven't committed to a share buyback program. Um, what we've stated, uh, and, and a lot of people I think perhaps missed this, we've stated that in the AGM, we're going to seek approval to have the ability to be able to do a share buyback pro program in the future. Um, so that's different from saying we're going to do a share buyback program uh, as opposed to a, a special dividend or a, an increased dividend. Our, our primary goal is still to deploy the cash through M&A. Um, if we don't find the right opportunity and if we continue to, to maintain such a, a high level of cash um, because commodity prices remain buoyant, we will look at the options of, of, of returning cash to shareholders. But I've got to be really clear, no decision has been made as to whether that would be through through special dividends or uh, through ordinary dividends or through share buybacks. So, so those are all on the table, um, but using the cash through m and is, uh, is, is probably the number one uh, option. Um, right, a couple of technical questions next. Um, firstly, what is the geological chance of success for the North Egg Well? Um, we, you know, and, and I, I don't like ducking any questions, uh, but we've never we've never published a, a geological chance of success for that well. Um, and I think it's not necessarily meaningful to to, to talk about uh, chance of success for a single well. Um, the, the one thing you know is as soon as you quote a, a chance of success, you know it's wrong um, because the answer is either yes or no. Um, so if you, you know, if you say it's 36 percent chance, then, you know, that's that's going to be wrong. Um, I've seen a number of analysts suggest that egg has a 50 percent chance of success. I can tell you it's not that big. Um, I, I, I don't believe it can be that high. Um, I believe it has a bigger chance of failure than success. Um, typically, a good exploration well, I believe, is in the range of one in five to perhaps a one in three chance of success. Um, I'll, I'll leave it at that. This is a this is a good exploration well, but it's not a 50 percent chance of success. The next question was, if the exploration well is successful, what's the approximate time and cost to get it into production? Now, frankly, it just depends on how big the, the discovery is. Uh, if it comes in at that, that range of expectation of 60 million barrels, um, it, it would probably be a one or two well development. We've got a lot of experience through RUM. Um, you know, and if it's a, a one or two well development, it's a relatively inexpensive, you know, there's a couple of wells which would cost uh, 100 million pounds uh, for, for, for two wells if we had to drill them. I say relatively inexpensive, that's a huge amount of money, but um, in oil field terms, that's relatively inexpensive. It will be a relatively short um, pipeline tieback. Um, uh, I would expect to our existing Bruce facilities, which wouldn't need huge upgrades. We would probably take the opportunity to upgrade some of the um, some of the the the, the, the facilities, uh, particularly around um, emissions reduction programs. Um, we'd have to work with the, the, the regulator and the regulatory bodies to agree exactly what the, the development scheme looks like. So, you know, I, I don't have an accurate up-to-date cost right now, but 
it wouldn't involve building a new platform. It wouldn't involve significant new kit. So we would expect the um, uh, the timeline to be relatively short um, and uh, and the cost to be to be relatively low. If it is a single well tieback, then I think we would reasonably be targeting 2025 for, for, for first production. Um, there was a question that I'm not going to read all of it out because it's a very, very long question. Um, There's a question um, actually criticizing our, our costs uh, and saying that we've not reduced costs um, uh, as much as, as this uh, correspondent expected um, and that we've not increased production as much as they expected um, and asking about future production. We, when we took over the assets of BKNR, BKR, the, the operating costs were around $18 per barrel. Um, that was in 2018. We're, we're still below that. We're at 1650 last year. Um, and, you know, that compares to a, to, to a UK average of over $20 per, per BOE. So I think we can demonstrate that we've kept our costs good. I think just to be lower than they were four years ago is, uh, is, is, um, is, is quite, quite an achievement. Um, but I understand that, 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 that some, um, some people are, are, are disappointed with that. Um, the production levels uh, also seem to disappoint some people, but um, I think, as I've said probably too often now, we're very proud of the fact that we um, you know, have increased production through last year, um, and we've done this whilst not impacting our reserves in the ground. So I think that is you know, a very, very significant um, a, a achievement. Um, and this questioner was asking how we're going to keep production up in the future. Um, and, you know, I think I've already talked about the fact we're doing an intervention campaign and we have a, a you know, a program uh, in, in, in following years. We will continue to invest in our assets and that, I think, will help us to, uh, to, to continue to, um, to, to maintain and increase production. Um, right, next question. Um, during RUM DSV repair downtime, Appears as if Bruce increased daily production by circa 50%. Mitch's RNS on RUM stated, during the RUM shutdown, we've been able to optimize the Bruce production rates. Question is, are we maintaining that optimized production? Da -da 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 -da. If not, what is restricting us from doing so? Sorry, my phone call coming in. I need to kill. Um, so um, Bruce and RUM share elements of, um, of processing equipment on the Bruce platform. When when Bruce, uh, well, sorry, when Rum wasn't producing, it's only Bruce that is using that uh, that 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 facility. Um, when they're both commingled, the Bruce production needs to overcome back pressure that is is created by Rum coming into those facilities. I'm oversimplifying. I'm not a process engineer. This is a big over oversimplification. Mm -hmm. So when Rum isn't there, it's easier for Bruce production to uh, to, to 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 hit the equipment. Um, and we were able to, to maximize that to get this extra 3,000 BOE per day out of, um, uh, out of, um, out of, out of Bruce. Um, now that RUM is back on and back up at, at high rates, we are, um, we're not able to do that. So Bruce has gone back to its, its previous levels. So I think it was good work by the team to be able to maximize Bruce production during the, the lack of RUM production. But unfortunately, you can't have both. Um, so I hope that um, I hope that explains that. Um, next question was on hedging, uh, and there have been a few questions on hedging, uh, and I see that there are a few um, um, coming in on the uh, on, on 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 the live Q and A. Um, so, uh, and this question was: um, Are are you now seeing the options market catch up with UK gas prices? Are there now counterparties willing to offer puts at prices you might consider buying? Um, our, our hedging strategy has has always been to, to protect our downside rather than to, to, to capture our upside. Um, and we can do that by by buying puts, um, which are, you know, floor protection, if, if you like. Um, the put market has not recovered to a position where we see any value in that market at all. Um, the, basically, the put market is where it was. Um, uh, in fact, it's probably slightly more expensive than where it was prior to the current um, um, takeoff in, in gas prices. The, the counterparties um, are, are, are scared by 
volatility um, and do not want to sell uh, fixed priced instruments. So we have not put any new hedges in place since last July, and we have no immediate uh, intention to do so. As I've said before, you know, our, our hedging policy worked really well for us in 2020. Um, it enabled us to, to invest um, and enabled us to get to where we are today. But we've now got significant cash, uh, and we see that cash as providing the, uh, the, the, the hedges that, uh, that, that we need. Um, what next? That's an interesting question. Um, and it goes like this. A few years ago, I seem to recall that you expressed an interest in leaving the AIM market and transferring to the main market. Is that still your intention? And if so, what timescale could we expect? We've, we've, we've looked at this in, in a lot of detail. Um, and and you know, first, I guess I should say there's there's pros and cons in, in moving to the to the main market. Um, you know, on the positive side, there are definitely um, uh, or there is definitely the perception that there would be more interest from some tracker funds um, who would be um, almost obliged to um, to invest. Um, the flip side of that is that there are some there are some funds that only invest in uh, in, in AIM stocks, so we might have a, a negative there. Um, the biggest negative, as we see it, is from an individual investor's point of view, um, where um, if you go to the main market, our shares would attract stamp duty. Um, there would be inheritance tax issues and capital gain gift relief issues. So, um, you know, whilst we have a, I have a number of shareholders who who regularly ask uh, and, and lobby for us to uh, to move to the main market, and I think we're we're, we're just about big enough that we could do that. Um, there are also a number of shareholders that that are very very concerned about the the tax uh, implications of, of doing so. I think the other two things that come into it is that if you go to the main market, there is an increased regulatory burden. Um, there are more, uh, there's more bureaucracy for, for us to do. Uh, but more importantly, um, the actual entry to the main market requires a an extensive prospectus to be um, to, 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 to be published. Um, and this really is an expensive and time consuming legal process to um, to, 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 to gain entry. Um, our thinking is that that would be better addressed at the time that we're doing something else. So if we do another M&A deal, um, that is likely to lead to the requirement for a prospectus. Um, and if we're doing the prospectus in order to do the M&A deal, then that may be a better time for us to, uh, to, to, to look at the main market. So we're, we're not saying no, but we are saying that we need to find the right time um, to, to look at um, uh, to look at moving to the to the main market. Um, I think that's that's got the gist of most of the um, um, pre sent messages. Um, I'm not sure if I did this one. There's one around um, direct to share purchases, which I think it's it's a difficult one, but I, I'll take it on. Uh, and it says direct to share purchases. In all the time I've been a shareholder, I've not experienced an RNS stating that a director has purchased shares on the open market. Why is that? Why do the directors at all levels not participate in purchasing shares and backing the company? It is a tricky one, and I can't speak um, for, for individual directors, um, and um, I, I wouldn't want to speak for the individual directors. I can point out that, that I think almost 3% of the company is held by the, the directors collectively. Um, so there is no lack of uh, a, 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 of director um, investment or interest in, in the company. Um, I can also point out that every single employee in the company is uh, enrolled in incentive schemes uh, that are linked to share price performance. So every single employee has an incentive uh, uh, to, to be aligned with investors to, 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 to work on the share price. So I can't answer why or how individual um, directors um, choose to, to, to invest, um, but I can say that I don't believe there's any misalignment between the directors or the staff uh, and, uh, and shareholders. Um, so I think that's got, got most of the, of the pre-sent wells uh, questions. Uh, I'll go through now the, the long list um, of other questions that have just come in. Some of these, uh, I, and I'll, I'll apologize, I, I won't 
dodge any questions, um, but some I'm not allowed to answer. So, and I'm not going to answer questions on specific M and A targets, and I'm not going to answer questions. Yeah, I, 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 that's that would just be. I'm sure you can understand would be um, commercially insensitive, um, and I can't forecast cash positions for the end of this year, as someone has asked, um, because um, yeah, I, I, I just under under AIM rules, I'm, I'm not allowed to do those things. Um, so next question, can I give thinking about hedging, um, um, letting the contracts run off? I think I've touched that already. Next question, does the 20th of April cash balance include March revenue payments received in April? Yes, it does. Um, next question was about dividend. I've answered. Uh, next question was about share buybacks, which I think I've answered. Next question, why just one dividend a year? Why no interim? I think I've answered that. We are, we will consider a, a, a dividend, uh, an interim dividend, um, but at the moment it has just been one, um, one per year. Next question, do you see opportunities for further North Sea consolidation? Uh, absolutely. Um, we see lots of opportunities within the North Sea um, and we think we're ideally positioned to, um, uh, to, 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 to participate in that. So, so yes, um, we're very, very buoyant around the future of the North Sea. And we see that the political environment is improving. We're seeing a lot of stuff coming out of government now that is encouraging uh, investment in the North Sea. So we're, we're very happy with, uh, with where we are. Um, next question, would you consider paying special dividends? Sorry, I think I've ca captured that already. Next question, would you consider diversifying away from the North Sea? Yes, we will. Um, but initially, we see lots of opportunities in the North Sea. So I think at the moment, that's where we want to be. Um, but ultimately, I do hope that we will be able to, to, to go further um, uh, 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 further from the North Sea. Uh, next question was about share buybacks. Uh, next question was, are you continuing efforts to farm down the North Egg Well, or have you stopped that process and want to remain at 100%? I mean, the, the well is spudding, as I say, within the next uh, three months. Um, so we are committed to drilling that well 100% now. Um, so that will be a 100% Serica well. You never say never. If someone came in with a knockout offer and really wanted to, to join in at the last moment, we would um, we would consider it. But I think it's I think it's very, very unlikely now. Um, next question, what are the prospects for repeating the value enhancing non-dilutive purchases from BP and Total? Um, are the North Sea aspects of other oil majors realistic potential targets? Uh, yeah, as I said, I, th I think there are prospects to, to repeat those sorts of deals, not, perhaps not in exactly the same form as the BKR deal, uh, but we believe that, that majors will continue to, um, to be looking to divest um, in, in the next few years. And so, um, so, so, yeah, I think there are good opportunities going going forward. Um, next one. As a private investor, I can't really hedge against gas price falls other than sell my sh shares in Serica. Wouldn't it make sense to hedge at high prices at least some of your production? Yeah, I mean, this is this is a question we we face routinely, um, and. I think the the hedge market is is dysfunctional at the moment. Uh, a lot of people think we can just go out and hedge at at current prices. Um, if we were to do that, we would be taking significant security risk, um, and and so the market isn't there. Um, you know, we do, as I say, and we've always said, we do see hedging as a downside product, product protection, and we're not trying to lock in high sides. So. You know, it's 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 difficult, but there isn't really that option um, um, to us. Um, next one: How much of the reserves increase is due to gas price increase versus technical revisions? I don't have a percentage. Um, I would say that this year more was due to technical revisions than gas price increases um, because of the big impact of R three and the impact of the work that we're doing on on Bruce. Um, so, uh, yeah, it, it's, it certainly wouldn't be true to assume that, that all of the, the reserve revisions is due to gas price. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's largely due to technical, um, um, uh, technical issues. Um, how long can you keep increasing reserves on your existing fields at similar rates to the last two years? Um, I don't know. Um, we will do it uh, for as long as we can. Um, I think, you know, the Erskine uh, purchase is a really good example. So we, we bought Erskine, uh, which is a much smaller field that I haven't really talked about very much today. We bought our interest in Erskine seven or eight years ago. Um, when we bought that, 
um, uh, from memory, we were buying 3.3 million barrels of oil equivalent. I may have that number slightly wrong. Um, we had a um, uh, an independent CPR done on Erskine at the start of this year, and there's 3.2 million BOE left. So, you know, we, we've been producing that field for seven years. We've produced over 5 million BOE, our share, out, out of that field. Um, and, and we've still got left what we started with. So I think that shows that you, if you get it right, um, and we're not the operator there, so that, that you know the, the operator and, and the other partners are, are all responsible for that. But if you get it right, you can replace reserves year on year for for seven years. Um, so you know I think we've got a long way to go with the the portfolio we've got. Um, are there any deep bottlenecking opportunities to increase production from BKR given the productive capacity of R three is higher? We're looking at these things, and and I think there may be, um, but I would hate to uh, to be definitive on that. So you know, we're aware of, of the potential of of rum, uh, and we're looking for ways to to de bottleneck. And also, as I said earlier, you know, we we we've discovered this phenomenon that uh, that Bruce on its own can do more than when rum's there. So we're looking at ways that we can, um, uh, you know, we can we can uh, access that uh, extra productivity. So. Um, yeah, that's 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 a possibility, but it's not something I can give you a um, um, a definitive answer on. Um, uh, from the same questioner, are you considering a second Columbus well? Not yet. I mean, Columbus has been in production for um, you know less than five months. Uh, we need to get good pressure data and understand um, more about Columbus before we. Um, uh, before we uh, would, would consider a second well. It was always planned as a one well development. I think a second well is unlikely. Um, can you confirm what, if any, payments have been paid or are yet to be paid in 2022 for BKR to the operators you acquired the assets from. So yeah, at the start of the year, there was still some outstanding payments um, to be made. I think it was from memory, it was 93 million pounds was outstanding. The vast majority of that has now been settled uh, and was settled before the 20th of April when we gave that new cash number out. So there, there is probably single figure millions left to pay. The, the vast majority of that has been uh, has been settled now. Um, just had an RNS, a non-exec director has resigned. Any information on this? Um, Ian Van um, uh, was a non-executive director since I joined the company. Um, he's been on the board for, I think, 14, 15 years. Um, and there are guidelines about um, independence of um, non-executive directors. Uh, and so we are encouraged to... Um, uh, to rotate directors. Um, Ian was a fantastic, fantastic aide to this company um, and has been really, really instrumental that in everything we've done. We're really, really sad to see him go, but um, I'm afraid, you know, cor best corporate governance does uh, does determine that you do need to move uh, your non-executive executive directors on uh, every, every now and again. Um, can the presentation be shared? Um, well, given that um, we are now two minutes before the end, I may hand you back um, uh, to um, to. Absolutely, I can answer that question as well, Mitch. The presentation will be available on the Investment Meet Company platform literally moments after we finish uh, the meeting today. Um, and thank you very much, Mitch, as I say, for covering off so many questions. And thank you to all the investors for that. Perhaps, Mitch, as, as we are coming up to time, I could just ask you just for a few closing comments just to summarise just before redirecting investors to give you feedback. And, of course, you will have the ability to review any further questions that we have in. And we'll publish responses where appropriate to do so on the Investor Meet Company platform. Okay, thanks. Uh, well, thank you, everyone. Um, we, you know, I, we've got through a lot in, in a short period of time there. Um, the, the presentation will be shared on this platform. It's also already on our on our website, so you can find it there. Um, I, I, you know, I'm not going to reiterate. I think I've, I've gone over the story uh, so much. I think we've got ourselves in a, in a, in a really um, strong position and we see some exciting opportunities going forward. Um, we, as I've already said, we do like interacting with our shareholders. We do appreciate the support of our shareholders. Um, uh, and, and we do, you know, we, 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 we value your input. So, 
you know, we will, this is the first time I've done one of these and I, I'd, I'd be interested in your feedback on, on, on how you think this has gone. Um, but we, uh, we will do this again. Um, uh, but in the interim, um, please feel free, as I say, to contact us through our website uh, or through the info at sericaenergy.com um, um, uh, email address. Um, if at that stage, I don't think there's anything else I want to say. So um, I appreciate your time. Um, and that's all from me. Rich, thank you so much for, for a great presentation and for answering so many of the investors' questions. Can I please ask investors not to close the session? It should be automatically redirected to provide your feedback in order that Mitch and the team can better understand your views and its expectations. This will only take a few moments to complete and be greatly valued by the company. On behalf of the management team of Serica Energy PLC, we'd like to thank you for attending today's presentation. That concludes today's session. Thank you and good afternoon.